VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of EK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. A very pleasant good evening to everybody that's uh, tuned in tonight's broadcast and uh, trust that everybody is feeling okay and has dry feet. Okay, I think uh, everything is flying okay here. Um, we're only going to be doing a short broadcast uh, tonight. Uh, I think I say that uh, every week. Uh, and uh, generally it uh, extends out to uh, uh, an hour and a half or so, but not tonight. Um, I've got a trip to Adelaide to do tomorrow, so I'll be uh, heading, to, uh, heading to bed early and... Um, uh, hopefully uh, leaving at about 6 o'clock in the morning. So uh, just a, a short cast tonight uh, with a few interesting articles that I very quickly put together in the last half hour. We're broadcasting on 3541 kHz in the uh, 80 metre amateur radio band and uh, simulcasting on 1865 kHz in the 160 metre band tonight SSB. Um, I decided to go a uh, single sideband tonight because there's so much static and noise around. It's uh, uh, I figured the SSB would be probably a little bit better for copy on uh, on both uh, 160 and uh, and 80, of course. <coughs> so uh, and of course, to uh, the the um, linear amplifier is getting a bit tired of the AM that I'm giving it. So <laughs> I figured that's another reason for uh, SSB tonight. Um, anyway, like I say, it's just a short cast, so uh, hopefully uh, everything will be okay. All right. Um, we're also by the uh, YouTube stream too, uh, so if, uh, there's a few images tonight, um, as normal. So if you uh, if you have a um, uh, a computer inside the uh, with you in the radio shack or the listening room where you might be, uh, of course, tune into my YouTube channel, VK3CSJ. Just type in VK3CSJ in the search Google um, in the YouTube search engine and uh, look for the little live symbol. Um, there'll be a little live symbol that'll be next to uh, to uh, what's happening right now. Um, we also have a email address uh, VK3EKH at gmail.com VK3EKH at gmail.com and uh, uh, and also the chat window Discord uh, chat window. Uh, up on the uh, the second monitor here, so uh, a very pleasant good evening to folks that are uh, making their way to the to the chat window, um, and uh, I can see that uh, Don VK three HDX has already uh, sent a report in, and uh, Mr Lewis uh, has also sent in a report. Um, okay, uh, okay, 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 okay. Just have a quick look at that. Make sure I read the email this time. <laughs> um, all right, uh, crashing through the noise on 80 and uh, uh, sounds great. Well, we're, it's, yeah, okay. And, of course, you followed up very quickly with the other email. Okay, no worries. Thanks, Don. Um, <laughs> cool. All right, and uh, Graham Lewis, VK3 Golf Lima, he says, usual good signal on 80, have a good broadcast, uh, working till 3 a.m. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, that's all right. I'm usually up till 3 a.m. anyway. Uh, but like I say, I'm heading off to Adelaide uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, in my trusty Subaru, I just hope it doesn't overheat or fall apart or, the, or anything like that. So um, coming home with a 400-kilogram uh, a.m. transmitter. So um, we'll uh, see how that works uh, a little bit later on. That's another story. <clears throat> All right, five past the hour, um, and uh, let's just get into to things so we can quickly finish up uh, tonight. Uh, for those who uh, are tuning in for the first time, uh, uh, of course, uh, you may not uh, know that I'm doing the broadcast on behalf of the uh, Astronomical Society of Victoria. It's been uh, going since 1988. Uh, so uh, it's a, it's been a, a long broadcast, and um, with the odd break, and, and oh, that reminds me, I, I won't be doing the broadcast next week. Um, I'll be off uh, go out doing something else on the Friday night. Um, I've got to be at a, at a place by eight o'clock. I don't know whether I'll be back in time to uh, to do something at ten. So uh, I'll give uh, I'll give next Friday a bit of a uh, a break, 
and uh, we'll be back the following Friday for the uh, ASV radio broadcast. The Astronomical Society of Victoria, founded in 1922, has well over 1,600 members scattered about the place. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8 p.m. at the Molio Hall National Herbarium in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dellsbrooks Drive, and in the surrounding streets. Admission is free. Visitors are most welcome. And uh, like I said, meetings kick off right on the, the noggin at 8 o'clock, and the aim is to finish by 10 o'clock. Privileges and these uh, monthly meetings, by the way, are, are um, uh, broadcasted on to uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube as well. If you can't make it into the um, into the club room, uh, into the uh, hall, uh, privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals, and other publications from the society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV's magazine, Crux which I have a copy here somewhere. In fact, the, the latest crux did come through, but it's still sitting in its wrapper. But uh, if you want to know what a, a crux looks like, that's it. That's uh, a crux there. If you're watching the uh, YouTube uh, screen, uh, that's a, an average average crux. So uh, <laughs> um, there it is. Um, okay. the um, uh, And, of course, the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Um, which is a, like an almanac. It's a decent little publication that ASV does on an annual basis. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector, a 300mm portable reflector, and there's also a 200mm refractor, which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens. There's also a photoheliograph uh, available at the observatory to, and is accessible to members too. The Society is also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan, so members can try before you buy. Regular oh, I'll forget that one. Uh, members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minutes drive north of Melbourne. Uh, there are a range of instruments available for members to use, uh, the larger two with appropriate training uh, and these range from 300 millimeter to 1000 millimeter in aperture also located on the site is the eight meter radio a fully uh, um, fully steerable 8.5 uh, meter uh, radio telescope uh, which uh, members can access with involvement with the radio astronomy section uh, members are encouraged to make and use telescopes advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Uh, other areas of interest uh, is instrument making. Um, uh, yes, and uh, the other is, yes, yes, right over that, uh, including deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, Auroral Meteor Comet, Radio Astronomy, Computing, Cosmology and Astrophysics, Historical Studies and Research and Astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV's website and, um, uh, and uh, notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra, which is the uh, uh, email. Uh, it's the electronic um, bulletin that comes out uh, every other week, uh, keeping members uh, up to date on various things that are happening. Uh, and that's uh, sent out, uh, of course, via email to members. Uh, please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or proposed, postponed. Uh, the Secretary, for more information, you can write to the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059. Melbourne, Victoria 3001. That's the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. But uh, like I say, all can be revealed if you just visit the ASV website at www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed. G'day to Stephen, who's just joined us up there on the... the um, 
email um, inbox. Uh, he says uh, 30 over 9 in Barring Up. I'll be going past there tomorrow. 125 northwest of Melbourne. Super signal as usual. Thank you, Mr. E SPX. Uh, is there anybody up on the chat window? Yes, I can see um, uh, Richard, VK3VRS, Cassio Pia, who's Nebs, and, uh, and of course, Richard again. So, uh, <laughs> come on, guys, populate the chat window. Um, hmm. Alrighty then. This is ASC Radio, VK3EKH. Uh, all right. I think so, yeah. Yes, voiceover. Um, <laughs> um, first uh, to uh, come up with tonight, I'm just going to quickly check my email there, but that's all right. What's that? Stream post. Oh, okay. Um, okay, 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 okay. At uh, 12 minutes past the hour. <clears throat> this is the first article I'm going to. I hope there's enough audio. Each time I back off from the microphone, it seems to drop off quite dramatically, but maybe that's just me and the headphones there, so I'm, I'm keeping up on the, the microphone here. Um, I have played around with the audio a little bit, um, but I'll just turn up the headphones so it's not this so disconcerting. One, two, three, four, five. Well, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, all right. <clears throat> this is published 30 minutes ago. Space.com. Okay, but I won't read the whole article. Um, I'll just go through to a point where I felt it's it's enough. Uh, new Earth monitoring weather satellite prepares for launch. Okay, is that what we wanted to read that out? I think there was something else I wanted to. Uh, um, I must have picked the wrong article on that one. Oh, look, I'll I'll just read this out anyway. Sorry about that. New Earth monitoring weather satellite prepares for launch. Uh, the Joint Polar Satellite System launching on November 1 will provide a new orbiting eye on our planet's uh, tumultuous weather system. Tumultuous weather systems. Uh, the third in a series of five polar orbiting satellites developed by NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, NOAA, um, to uh, study Earth's weather and environment will launch on Tuesday, November 1. Riding atop an Atlas V rocket from the Vandenberg Space Force Space in California, the JPSS-2 satellite, uh, which is part of the Joint Polar Satellite System, will blast off providing meteorologists and climatologists important data to help predict extreme weather events and to help uh, or to better understand how these events affect our planet. JPSS-2 will join the Samoy National Polar Orbiting Partnership, Samoy NPP, uh, which launched in 2011, and uh, NOAA-20, which launched in 2017 as JPSS-1 in polar orbit around Earth. JPSS-2 will be renamed as NOAA-21, and uh, once it is in orbit and conducting scientific operations, Two further launches of JPSS-3 and JPSS-4 are planned for 2027 20, and 20, 20, uh, 2032, respectively. In their polar orbits, the satellites circle the Earth 14 times per day. From this advantage point, JPSS-2 will observe every place on Earth at least twice a day uh, as the satellite orbits the Earth from pole to pole. Jim Walsh, director of the NOAA's JPSS program, said during a news conference held on October 4, to predict whether we really need to be able to observe Earth's atmosphere from this global perspective. To accomplish its mission, JPSS-2 will carry five key instruments into orbit, most of which are also on the Samoy NPP and NOAA-20. Two of these instruments, the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, or ATMS, and a Cross-Track Infrared Sounder uh, will monitor atmospheric temperature and moisture content, giving weather forecasters a global 3D picture of the most fundamental information required by forecast models, Walsh said. Two instruments will complement each other. The C, the cross-track infrared sounder is limited in how far it can see into clouds because the water vapor absorbs infrared light. But the ATMS microwave instrument can penetrate those clouds, allowing the instrument to see into the hearts of the storms. 
Another instrument is called Libra, uh, which will play the same role as the less advanced clouds and Earth Radiant Energy System, or CERES, instrument of Earth's surface and atmosphere, or how much energy is absorbed by the Earth's surface and atmosphere versus how much it is emitted back into space and how this affects the temperature on Earth. The Ozone Mapping Profile Suite, OMPS, will observe the ozone layer looking for holes and how the concentration of ozone and other aerosols varies globally. Finally, <coughs> uh, the Visual Infrared Imaging Radiometer or Radiometer Suite, VIIRS, is essentially the eyes of the satellite, Walsh said. The VIIRS will capture imagery of Earth's surface, oceans and atmosphere in visible and infrared light, revealing how much snow and ice covers the planet, how much of the planet is covered by clouds, which can affect the energy balance. Where fog shrouds the skies, the colour of the ocean and how, this, how that relates to the abundance of microscopic uh, high, high, phytoplankton, uh, the health and of vegetation based in the presence of chlorophyll and behavior of hurricanes, floods, wildfires and dust storms. In particular, the Joint Polar Satellite System project focuses on observing extreme weather events to understand them better. For example, Hurricane Ian, which slammed into the Caribbean and Cuba, Cuba uh, and the southeast United States at the end of September, initially began as a tropical atmospheric wave off the coast of West Africa. A storm in Africa can affect the development of a hurricane that hits the east coast. A typhoon in, typhoon in Japan can cause heavy rain in California several days later, Walsh said. This uh, so-called butterfly effect shows how interconnected Earth's weather systems really are and the Joint Polar Satellite System pro pro Project's uh, mission is to try to uh, disentangle uh, the factors that influence Earth's weather and environment on a global scale. As if we didn't have enough weather satellites already in orbit around Earth, I just don't get why they think this is going to be a little bit better than what's already up there. Nevertheless, they love to spend money on this sort of stuff, don't they? You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH, coming to you from the studios of VK3CSJ. In Narry Warren South. Good evening, Andrew. VK3KIS. He's just uh, sent me an email tuning in, listening in on the live stream uh, as my antenna has come down in the storm. I tell you that the weather that we've got at the moment is just bringing all this sort of strife to us. It's it's just can't wait until we get out of this uh, weather pattern at the moment. It's really, um, I've got problems with the back of the barn here flooding and it's there's water everywhere. It's just horrible. Anyway, it won't be long before we'll have going into another drought, so <laughs> as the cycle goes. Okay, next on the boom here is um, forget, your, uh, forget your morning commute. Now, uh, we now have a satellite traffic jams in space. There's no image here. Actually, did I have an image to, in that last one? No, I don't think I did. Oh, no, hang on, I've skipped an article. Oh, yes, I was there, wasn't I? All right, NASA. Okay, here we are. Sorry about that. Getting my articles mixed up. All righty then. Um, and we do have a picture here. Yep, okay. NASA's ailing Mars lander fills the shock waves from an ice-blasting meteoroid impact. This is 14 hours ago. Well, the article was published 14 hours ago. It was immediately clear that this is the biggest new crater we've ever seen. Christmas came one day early for our lone geologist stationed on red on the red planet. NASA's InSight mission touched down on Mars in November 2018 to peer inside the planet, mapping its layers and fault lines. And on December 24, 2021, the lander made a remarkable detection, catching seismic waves from a sizable meteoroid impact. Photos taken from orbit made the signal even more intriguing. Uh, because scientists uh, tied the seismic detection to the site of a large, fresh crater. And I'll bring up that picture of the crater. There it is, coming up on the screen as I speak. 
And back to the article. <coughs> um, it was immediately clear uh, that this new biggest, this this is the biggest new crater uh, that they've ever seen. Ingrid Delbar, in Science Impact Science lead and planetary scientist at Brown University, said during a news conference, uh, "We thought a crater this size might form somewhere in the planet on the planet once every few decades, maybe once a generation." Dubar said. So it was very exciting to be able to witness this event and to be lucky enough that it, that it happened uh, while InSight was recording seismic data. That was the real scientific gift, she says. And the picture you're seeing on the screen at the moment is an image taken by the uh, Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, a high-res uh, camera shows the impact crater that formed on December 24, 2021. So it's not exactly a new crater, but they've decided to analyse it. But there it is. Um, so in September, InSight scientists are now four detections of meteorite impacts each to each also tied to a fresh crater that were made in 2020 and earlier in 2021 but these were small impacts none produced seismic signals strong enough than a magnitude to quake <clears throat> in sites team members had a had deemed it unlikely that they'd see signals from more powerful strikes so the lander's christmas eve data were uh, a bolt from the blue those observations pointed to an impact that clocked in at a magnitude four and produced a crater more than 400 feet or 130 meters wide inside also observed a similar impact in september 2021 uh, which the mission team described in the scientific papers announcing these findings but even while InSight scientists were digging into the Christmas Eve impact uh, might mean, scientists with NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, <laughs> MRO, uh, which has been studying the red planet since 2006, uh, made a different discovery when they spotted a fresh large impact crater. And that's the one that's on the screen. When we first saw this image, we were extremely excited uh, um, Lilia Pozzaloba, Orbital Science Operations Lead for MRO and the M Malayan Space Science Systems in California said during Thursday's briefing, this was nothing like we've seen before, she says. Uh, Pozzaloba and her colleagues first spotted the fresh crater in data gathered by the MRO's context camera. The crater and the rays of debris circling the impact site filled in an entire frame, 30 kilometers wide. We need to take two more images on the sides to capture the entire per perturbance area, she says. Dubar said that the crater itself stretches about 150 meters, which uh, uh, she compared to two city blocks and noted that uh, 10 times the size of a typical new craters on Mars. So working backward from the size of the crater, scientists estimated that the asteroid that slammed into the red planet uh, was between 5 metres and 12 metres wide before it met its fate. Had it struck Earth, a rock the size would likely have burned up in Earth's atmosphere, but Mars' thin atmosphere doesn't do much to protect the surface. Thanks to the meteorite size, the impact dug deep into enough in, enough into the Martian surface to throw up boulder-sized chunks of rock and water ice. The most exciting of all, we saw clearly in the high-resolution images that a whole lot of water ice had been exposed by the impact, which you can see in the picture. And there's one more picture here, uh, which is a kind of a before and after image, uh, which I'll bring up. Uh, there it is so you can see for those watching the YouTube screen uh, there it is there's a, a before and an after of this uh, uh, impact that uh, has occurred so I'll just go back to the other one which is a nice high high res close-up image of the impact revealing the water ice uh, around it and again that's the before and after image there you can see so I'm going to leave that article there. There's a bit more to read, but I'm just going to move on. Uh, that's courtesy of space.com under the astronomy tab. Look for um, NASA's ailing Mars lander fills uh, the shockwaves from an ice blasting meteoroid impact. 
This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel ASV Radio, coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ. Okay, I've been pressing on the wrong things here. This is uh, another little quick article. No images attached to this one, so I shall go to the camera. Um, there we go, back on the screen. Uh, forget your morning commute. We now have satellite traffic jams in space. As active satellites continue to pile up, so does the risk of collisions. If that happens, it could, curious, it could cause serious turmoil for astronomers and the public, October 27. Gone are the days of traffic jams solely being a problem for, for drivers on their way to work. We now have to consider satellite congestion in outer space too. As it turns out, a growing number of active satellites is positively, positively uh, correlated to risks such as overlapping orbits and debris collisions. And as impending launches draw closer, experts are exploring how low Earth orbit, uh, the area around the Earth that has an altitude of less than 1,000 kilometers or um, about 620 miles, can accommodate the increasing number of satellites the private sector is projected to deploy in safe and sensible manner. While LEO has not yet been uh, reached rush rush hour levels of congestion, it's certainly on its way, according to Jonathan Rushman, an aerospace engineer who has studied the risk factors associated with orbital debris. He says, I hesitate to use the term traffic jam since satellites can't sit idling on their orbital highways, he says, but congestion is definitely a concern. SpaceX founder Leon Musk, who's decided to uh, buy Twitter, <laughs> that's, that's something else I've just thrown in there, I don't know why he spent so much money on that rubbish, uh, there's something wrong with that, um, billions of dollars on the, the Twitter thing, I just don't get it, but anyway, I, I'm not even going to say it's his money, that, the, that amount of money on something like Twitter could have been easily put straight into people that need it, so I just don't... Don't get their thinking there, but that's another story. SpaceX founder Leon Musk has previously come under fire for saying tens of billions of satellites could be could be accommodated in low Earth orbit. The claim that has since been reputed as the overly optimistic by experts, particularly in LEO, the number of satellites has been steadily increasing. Over 5,400 satellites are currently in orbit, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. <laughs> the Union of Concerned Scientists. It sounds like the um, the Institute of Silly Walks. What was it from um, Monty Python? It wasn't the Institute. It was something else. Uh, something of Silly Walks. Anyway, that's, that's what that sounds like. I can just imagine the the scientists rolling up to their union the, to their little office with uh, all these exaggerated Silly Walks. Union of Concerned Scientists. How's that? Gee, they come up with some funny things. Getting back to the article. That fatigue, <coughs> sorry, that figure <laughs> is projected to rise dramatically as space works, ex, um, space works exponentially to expand Starlink, its constellation of satellites. Uh, with frequent launches that uh, border on weekly, the Satellite Communications Corporation plans to build a, e, a LEO mega constellation containing 42,000 satellites to achieve global high-speed internet and phone services. As of July, SpaceX has, has already exceeded its 2021 record of 31 launches, the most liftoffs in a year. Mega constellations pose a significant risk to on orbit collisions, uh, Russ Rosman says. Uh, later uh, last year, Starlink satellites were already responsible for over half of uh, the close encounters in orbit. Since then, they have launched over 1,700 more satellites. In addition to SpaceX's ambitions, Amazon project uh, Kuiper plans to place 3,236 satellites into orbit. 
uh, One Web, uh, Iridium, Next, Global Star, and many other anticipated mega constellations will potentially add more than 8,000. 600 satellites into the low Earth orbit. My goodness. As many as 58,000 new satellites are expected to be launched into space by 2030, according to Aerospace. And while that's good news for space exploration and aerospace innovation, the trend could infringe upon the sustainability and viability of future space operations. So I'll just uh, go down to what to do next. <laughs> I'll just skip a couple of paragraphs there. So what to do next is the question mark in uh, with all this. Currently, all the major space agencies collaborate on object tracking and collision avoidance via the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, or IADC, which is a governmental uh, forum to internationally coordinate space junk and debris, uh, both nature and man-made. The IADC's guidelines include inactivating satellites at the end of their life cycles by venting leftover fuel and materials that could lead to explosions and lowering satellites far enough into atmosphere to ensure disintegration within 25 years. The organization's publicly posted recommendations can be used by aerospace companies to create systems and missions to reduce debris and avoid collisions. I can just see this getting worse. However, these best practices have more teeth when they become requirements specified by the agencies to their con contractors, um, such as NASA's NPR 8715 decimal 6, which is the agency's mandatory orbital debris requirements according to the, to Russ Mason. But as we have been late, have, have seen lately with Russia's planned withdrawal from the International Space Station, the state agencies are not immune to geopolitical strife, as Russman says. And even though Roscosmos, which is Russia's state space co corporation, is a part of the IADC, it didn't prevent their parent state from conducting an anti-satellite weapons or ASAT test last year, generating thousands of pieces of more debris. The IADC is a scientific collaboration. It needs political equivalent and is more binding. That's why experts say that the regulation needs to be forefront of any conversations concerning the future growth of space sector. All in all, preventing satellite congestion requires a multi-tiered uh, um, approach, including active debris removal policies that require launch providers and satellite operators to deorbit systems at the end of life, and states disavowing further ASAT tests. Only time will tell if these guidelines will be implemented in a timely manner by public and private space operations or operators as they continue to launch even more satellites. So the pollution up there continues to get worse. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Okay, this next article, we're going back to Mars. And there's an image here, which I shall bring up. Sorry, go back here. There it is, coming up. All right, magma on Mars may be bubbling underground right now as we speak. And this is 20 hours ago. Mars quake data are helping researchers identify possible red planet volcanism. And that picture you see on the screen there, uh, one of the fractures or the Garaben, G-R-A-B-E-N, Graben that make up Mars Cerberus Fosse system. The, the fractures cut through hills and craters, indicating their relative youth. So that's a real picture there. Uh, magma may still burble and bubble on Mars today, a new study suggests. 
Scientists know that Mars was volcanically active long ago. For example, NASA's, for example, NASA's Perseverance rover has encountered volcanic rocks on the floor of the Jezero crater, which hosted a lake and river delta in the distant past. And Mars's host, the 25-kilometer Olympus Mons, uh, a shield volcano that covers as much area in the state of Arizona, Olympus Mons, and its less celebrated neighbor peaks in the red planet's um, Theresis Montes region, likely started uh, growing billions of years ago, scientists claim. They, that growth may be ongoing. Researchers have been finding more and more clues that Martian volcanic activity extended into the recent past, perhaps as uh, has even continued to the present day. The new study, which is based on observations by NASA's InSight Mars lander, adds fuel to this rock melting fire. And there's another image I can bring up here too, very quickly, if I don't lose my space. Wrong, that's me. Um, there he is. Um, in Insight touched down near the red planet's equator, November 2018, on a mission to detect and characterize Mars quakes. Analysis of the lander's data are helping scientists learn more about Martian interior, including the planet's bulk com composition and the size of its core. Insight has measured more, more than 1,300 Mars quakes to date. In the new study, researchers analysed a subset of roughly 20 tremblors, tremblors, tremblors that are uh, originating in the Cerberus Fosse, a region of parallel fissures that lies about 11 degrees north of the red planet's equator. Characteristics of these quakes suggest that they are they've been spawned in a warm subsurface locale, magma or underground lava formed by volcanic activity, one explanation that could fit the bill nicely, study team members said. In addition, photos taken by Mars's orbiters show deposits of relatively dark dust extended outward from the Cerberus Fosse in multiple directions. The dark shade, the darker shade of the dust signifies geological evidence of more recent volcanic activity, perhaps within the past 50,000 years relatively young in geological terms. It is possible uh, that we are seeing what we are seeing are the last remnants of this once active volcanic region uh, or that the magma is right now moving eastward to the next location of eruption, he said. And you can s in this colored image that you see here of the surface, this is a color-coded topographic view shows the relative heights of features in Mars's Cerberus Fosse region. Reds and whites are relatively higher than blues and purples. The image is based on a digital terrain model of the region uh, from which the topography of the landscape can be derived. So though more work is needed to confirm and flesh out the new results, which were published online today, October 27, in Journal National, in, in the Nature Astronomy Journal. I'll leave it at that, I think. So if you want to catch up with that article, that's also space.com. All right. Uh, it's 20 minutes to 11 already, how quick the time goes when you're having fun. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night cast missions. All right, now, also courtesy of space.com. Where are we with this? Oh, yeah, okay. There's a picture up on the screen. Something spooky is happening at the edge of the solar system, published 21 hours ago. Oh, I have to get a, a softer chair. This is just not working for me. Uh, all right. What you're seeing on the screen is an artist's interpretation of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, leaving the heliosphere and entering interstellar space. Okay, how quick's this article? Oh, good. <laughs> 
Uh, just in time for Halloween, scientists have discovered something spooky and strange occurring at the edge of the solar system. The heliopause, the boundary between the heliosphere and the bubble of wind encompassing the solar system, and the interstellar medium, the material between the stars, appears to be rippling and creating oblique angles in an unexpected manner. The general concept that the heliopause changes shape is not new. Over the past decade, researchers have determined that it's not static. They made this discovery using data from Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, <clears throat> the only two spacecraft to exit the heliosphere thus far, as well as NASA's Interstellar Boundary Explorer, IBEX satellite, which studies the emissions of energetic neutral atoms uh, that are created when solar winds and interstellar medium interact. The Voyager spacecraft provided the only direct in situ measurements of the locations of these boundaries, but only at one point in space and time. Eric uh, Zierstein, oh Eric Zier, Zierenstein, a space physicist and Princeton University, <coughs> wrote in an email to the Vice IVX helps round out the data. He says, all right. Finally, scientists have used the data to create models that predict how the heliopause changes. In a nutshell, uh, solar winds and the interstellar medium push and pull each other to create an ever-moving boundary. But recent research in the heliopause has surfaced data that contradicted the previous findings. Over a period of several months in 2014, IBEX captured the brightening of ENAs that indicated asymmetries in the heliopause, and the team later realized that these asymmetries were in congruous <laughs> with models Vice noted. Furthermore, in revealing, or in reviewing at least, the data from the journeys of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, the scientists discovered that the heliopause changed dramatically in a very short period of time, and that helps to explain why there's, there was such a large gap between the two probes' entrances, entrances into the interstellar space, which happened in 2012 and 2018 respectively. But that kind of movement by heliopause also clashes with the models. In a paper published on October 10 in the journal Nature Astronomy, the researchers called these discrepancies intriguing and potentially controversial. They plan to continue studying the heliopause, hoping to gain more insight from NASA's Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, a new and improved satellite that can detect in ENAs and is scheduled to launch in 2025. More satellites going into space. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH, coming to you from the studios of VK3CSJ in Nary Warren South. All right. Um, okay. There's a bit of reading in this, but this might be an interesting little article too. Uh, where are we? Get to this one here. Okay. This young lady you're seeing on the screen right now is Donna Albert. Donna Albert work on planetary magnetic fields finally comes to light. As a human computer for a world-renowned scientist, Donna Albert made great contributions that went largely unrecognized for decades, not anymore. For more than 60 years, or more than 60 years ago, <clears throat> a woman with no advanced training in mathematics created a theory about planetary magnetic fields. Her name, Donna Albert, her job, a human computer, working for famed astrophysicist Subrahmanian Chandra Eskaka. No, now, 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 now researchers, Susan Horn of Conventry University and Jonathan Anu of UCLA are combining Albert's work with modern computer power to uncover more about the complex physics that give rise to still poorly understood planetary magnetic fields or magnetic spheres. 
magnetospheres. The results may help scientists better understand Earth's own magnetic field as well as potentially point to exoplanets that could likewise sustain global magnetic fields that are strong enough to protect life. Computers at their most basic level are calculating machines, but before computers sat upon the desks of every researcher and office worker, they took up entire rooms and specialists were required to operate them. And before that, computers were human beings who did realms, reams of calculations by hand, or at best with a calculator, which is only minor help when it comes to complex analytical physics. The vast majority of these human computers were women, some had advanced mathematical backgrounds, but many had only high school degrees. The job was usually treated much like a secretarial position, requiring most fine attention to detail. While some human computers stuck to to um, to rote calculations, R-O-T-E, more than a few took to the math with su superior skill, turning up insights and improvements that showed that they had a deep understanding of the theories behind the equations. One of these particularly intelligent computers was Donna Eta Albert. For more than 30 years, she worked with legendary astrophysicist and Nobel laureate Subramanian Kandashka, <laughs> who is most famous for discovering the, uh, the eponymous Chandashkya limit. That's his surname. This limit refers to the maximum mass a white dwarf can reach before it collapses into a black hole. In brackets, a white dwarf is the dense remnant left over after the normal life of a sun-like star ends. Close bracket. Chandra Eskar was ahead of his time, too, when he published in his namesake, his, his namesake limit the very ex, ex, uh, ex the, the very existence of black holes was still in doubt. For many years, his prediction was seen mostly as mathematical quirk, unlikely to have much bearing on the real world. Albert was originally brought on as Chandra's, Chandra Eskar's computer, but she rapidly became an integral part of the research process. Albert shares publication credit with Chandra Eskar on multiple papers, and he references her in footnotes of, of, of many more. Today, anyone contributing as much as she did to Chandra Eskar's work would be listed as a co-author and treated uh, and credited as a whole fellow researcher. But in the 1950s, Albert was simply seen as a computer. He wasn't taking her work he, he wasn't taking her work on notes about Chandra Eskar. He really tried to give her credit. It was just in the time of the 50s. So, magnets, it's complicated. Albert and Chandra Eskar worked on many different topics during their long professional partnership. And in the early 1950s, they, just, they were focused on complex magnetic fields of planets. Every planet rotates or spins causing the Coriolis effect, an internal force that deflects everything from air and water to missiles. Its strength, its strength depends on how quickly a planet spins. A past rotating planet like Jupiter, where, on, where, where one day is only 10 hours long, has a very strong Coriolis effect. You can see the effects in the broad and visible bands in Jupiter's atmosphere. Meanwhile, a slowly rotating planet like Venus, which spins around only once every 243 days, has almost no Coriolis effect or branded appearance, banded appearance. Magnetic fields arise from moving charged particles, and Earth has liquid a liquid metal core. Other planets have salty oceans. When these materials churn, they create magnetic fields which then exert forces on the particles within them. Many planets with warm or wet interiors, Earth included, also experience convection, 
This phenomenon is seen in the motion of a lava lamp, where warm material rises upward, cools, and then falls down to be heated again. Together, these factors result in a complicated sloshing and swirling within planets and particularly liquid interiors, and because the movements of Earth's liquid metallic core creates its magnetic field, the field itself is complex, far more so than the standard Earth as a bar magnet illustrations imply. And there's just another image here, part of this article. <laughs> <coughs> So what we're seeing in that picture there is Earth's magnosphere, magnetosphere helps protect it from a dangerous radiation from sources such as the solar wind as seen in this artist's concept. Albert was working with Chandra Scar when the first she when she first noticed that if the strengths of the rotation and magnetic fields are roughly equal, then convection pockets tend to organize into heat, large-scale patterns in, instead of smaller, more turbulent ones. This is the sweet spot that leads, or that lets a world host a strong global magnetic field like we see here on Earth. Earth's magnetic field is responsible for the brilliant northern and southern lights, but more importantly, it protects Earth's surface and atmosphere from harmful radiation making life possible. Scientists know what causes simple magnetic fields, and they know that Earth is, has a large, complex magnetic field. But there's still a large gap in their ability to mathematically detail exactly how Earth's magnetic field forms and behaves. And scientists are always looking to close those gaps in understanding. It's just that sometimes it takes a long time. So, um, uh, new, uh, a new life for Albert's old theory. Horn has been studying magnetic fields her whole career, but Albert's prior work only first came to her attention a few years ago. Horn says that Chandraskar's textbook on magnetic field is required reading in her field, but no one actually read the footnote, Horn says, at least no one I talked to, she says. The footnote in question isn't a, isn't a vague thanks to Albert for cranking through math that would make a grown physicist weep. Instead, it specifically credits her with the insight about when magnetic and rotational forces match up. Despite this observation sitting in plain sight for decades, it took a long time before scientists could apply it. Rotation, convection and magnetism harmonize in subtle ways that defy a straightforward algebraic description or cartoon illustration. The only way forward in, uh, in uh, uh, analytics, cranking through complex math, a speeds uh, only feasible, feasible with the last decade or so, according to Horn. Before that, scientists had to choose rotation or convention to take another to take another simplifying measures. The computing power needed to capture the more politic complicated physics Albert put forth just wasn't available yet. But now, armed with new computer power and methods, Horn and Anur returned to Chandra Scar and Albert's decades old work. They teamed that scenario. They termed that scenario of Albert's range uh, that they were planning to more papers expanding in her original observations. Horn says the most impressive part is that she didn't have a university degree. <laughs> she said, tough math, that would be hard for me. Unfortunately, Albert died in 2019 at the age of 90. Horn never spoke to her personally, but after bringing Albert's work to light, one of her relatives contacted Horn. They said that Albert would be thrilled to see her work and name achieving such recognition, and Horn calls that one of the, the proudest moments of her career. Uh, that's better than research, she says. So, there it is. Um, the uh, computers of um, those uh, bygone days, all using brain power and... Uh, it's a pretty amazing sort of a time for those uh, ladies that were involved in that uh, all that research of that time. All right, um, and that article you'll find if you wish to go over it yourself is from astronomy.com under the news tab. Donna Albert's work on planetary magnetic fields finally comes to light. 
Uh, all right, at four minutes to 11, there is just one more thing here. I uh, figured that it will be worthwhile and uh, a bit interesting. Um, <clears throat> huge HAARP antenna array is bouncing radio signals off Jupiter. And uh, I thank you to, uh, uh, to John for sending that article to me. This is published one day ago. There's a picture here. <coughs> oh, I'll bring that up. All right. HARP, current research program, has been called unprecedented. That picture that you see there, the antenna array at the High Frequency Active Rural Research Program, or HARP, facility at the University of Alaska. The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program Facility, or HARP, is in the midst of a wide-range science campaign that will see the facility bounce signals off the Moon and Jupiter. HARP consists of 180 antennas designed to transmit signals into the ionosphere, which stretches from 48 kilometres to 965 kilometres above sea level and is seen as the area where Earth's atmosphere meets space, according to NASA. The ionosphere plays an important role in radio transmission as it reflects radio waves. Many satellites occupy this region of the atmosphere, uh, which is heavily influenced by solar weather. HARP is in the midst of a 10-day research campaign that its facilities, large and most diverse to date, HARP program manager Jessica Matthews said in a statement, among the 13 experiments being conducted during the campaign are projects that will see signals bounced off the Moon and Jupiter in order to test HARP's ability to study objects far from Earth. One of the most ambitious experiments being conducted out during HARP's current program is known as Jupiter Bounce, or Interplanetary Iosond, according to a statement from the University of Alaska's Fairbanks. The experiment will test HARP's ability to bounce signals off the ionosphere of Jupiter uh, while also determining how well receivers at the University of New Mexico's Long Wave Array can receive the reflected signals. The experiment is the largest active remote sensing, sensing operation in history according to the UAF statement. This is a first of its kind experiment which uh, at least to my knowledge has never been attempted before. HARP's research support services lead Evans Callis told as well as public media. We transmit several different frequencies from HARP detected at Jupiter. We listen to or we listen for the echo that returns and that should be able to tell us something about the electromagnetic conditions around Jupiter. And there's another close up of the antennas systems here. There it is on the screen as we speak. Another experiment known as Moon Bounce will see signals bounce off the Moon back towards the receivers in New Mexico and California. These signals will be evaluated for their use in determining the composition of near-Earth asteroids for future planetary defense purposes. Meanwhile, HARP's Making the Invisible Visible experiment will test if not hot, will test uh, experiment will test if hot electrons are capable of producing the continuum white emissions present in Steve uh, Airglow. Steve, which is short for Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement, is an aurora-like phenomenon that occurs when charged particles from the sun interact with Earth's atmosphere. If we see that airglow and match its wavelength of light, uh, that we see from the naturally occurring Steve experiment that would give us an indication that the hot electrons are playing some role in the formation of Steve, Callis said. And there's a picture here. I think I might have got that one. Did I take that? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Anyway, there's an image here uh, of uh, the strong thermal emission velocity enhancement, Steve which is photographed on September 5, 2022. And it's actually, it, look, it looks like an aurora, uh, but it's actually a, a man-made one, I gather. 
one of the more unique experiments is ghosts in the air globe which will with will mix art and atmospheric research to play with minimal boundaries of earth's atmosphere and outer space according to the project's website the experiment will use harp to bounce images spoken word and sound off the ionosphere to learn more about radio propagation the harp facility was constructed in 1993 and originally operated by several united states military research agencies including the defense advanced research projects agency and uh, and a few others there so i'll just finish that article here actually so you can find that article uh, on space.com under the um, astronomy tab i think it is anyway so yeah so they're wanting to use the harp antenna array for bouncing radio signals off the moon and off jupiter not all that new um, in fact the arecibo radio telescope has already been there and done that so finally here at two minutes past 11 i th- knew i could get this uh, over and done with quickly <laughs> tonight um <clears throat> spaceweather.com all right let's have a look at the sun Mm. all right solar wind uh yes the solar wind is currently at 381.3 kilometers a second at a density of 16.11 protons per cubic centimeter Uh, as we look at the disk of the sun there are one two three four four sunspots on the disk of the sun as we speak the sunspot number is currently 72 and the radio sun measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters is currently 130 solar flux units 130 that's up there and the current aurora we'll go to the aurora this is the uh, aurora borealis uh, australis over the south pole as we speak so it's a decent green glow um but it's nothing to rave home about it's not it's fairly average and of course the uh, current charts for uh, these number of sunspots uh, together with the radio flux and you can see how they mirror each other so that's the current uh, coming up to cycle 25 those two cycles you can see them virtually mirroring each other sunspot activity together with radio flux measurements all right and to finish off the space weather there's a geomagnetic storm watch NOAA forecasters say that there's a chance of a G1 class geomagnetic storm on October 29 when a stream of solar wind is expected to hit Earth's magnetic field the gaseous material is flowing from a cheerful hole in the Sun's atmosphere high altitude sky watchers should be alert for auroras this weekend and just going down uh, and as of October 28, 2022, there were 2,311 potentially hazardous asteroids, which most of them are listed just below that on spaceweather.com. So I think that will conclude the uh, session tonight. And um, well, there you go. We, <laughs> I can't do it. I just cannot do everything in half an hour. It's just impossible. So on that basis, uh, we see uh, Ian has also sent us an email. So thanks, Ian, for your email. Um, Long mouse. He says, hi, Clint. Thank you for the session. And it's 20 over 9, a little bit of phasing and all that. So no worries, Ian. Uh, Excellent stuff. And uh, there's also one from Andrew VK3KIS2 live listening on the live stream as my antennas came down. Oh, yeah, okay, we knew that. All right, not many up on the chat window tonight. It's been very quiet. Um, only a couple of stations there on the chat window. So it doesn't matter. All right, um, I think on that note, we shall conclude our broadcast for tonight i hope that at least one of those articles uh, read out tonight were of some value and some interest um and like i say i won't be here uh, next week uh, so it'll be a friday off uh, but i'll return back next the following friday which will be uh in november <laughs> uh the 11th there we are november the 11th 
see how quick we are going through this year. So this is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ and a very wet and damp uh, ground here at uh, Narry Warren South. Concluding transmissions for tonight on 160 metres. Uh, I hope you, uh, we, we ran a, an SSB signal tonight rather than AM. I think my linear is happier for that. So uh, that's all cool. So uh, more information about the society can be found at ASV, the www.asv.org.au. And uh, I might also mention that this weekend we're seeing the um, uh, Sea Lake Astro Fest happening up there at Sea Lake. Uh, I wish everybody up there a great time. Uh, I suspect that a lot of people have already um, gone up there and staying overnight at some place. So the Sea Lake Astro Fest 2022, more information can be found from the homepage of the ASV. Um, but there's a, a lot of happening up there and I hope the weather plays nice for you guys up there. So all, all good luck. Uh, but like I say, all that information can be found at the uh, homepage here on the front of the uh, ASV's homepage. This is VK3 EKH, the official station for the Astronomical Society of Victoria, concluding transmissions in 1865. Standby stations on 80 metres for a quick callback, and uh, we shall see submissions on 1865. Cheers to everybody on 1865. All right. Now, I better get up and switch speakers. Oh. Uh, all right. So, pen and paper. Um, here it is. All right, this is VK3 EKH listening on. Oh, I'm going to take these headphones off. <laughs> Ooh, how different that is. VK3 EKH listening on 3541 kilohertz. Okay, VK3 VIM, VK3 BDA, and VK3 Fox Tango X ray, was it? Oh, it's a VK3 SPX. Oh. Was that what you thought it was? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> SPX. All right. I don't know where I got the FTX from. No idea. Uh, it's because I've, I've had been wearing headphones. Uh, all of a sudden, the dynamics have changed. <laughs> Have a say in VK3 VIN, VK3 H, um, <sighs> sorry Don, VK3 VIN, VK3 EKH, get it right Clint, oh god, take it in.
Yeah, thanks, Ian. VK3, VIN, VK3, EKH. Yeah, just a little bit hard to copy. That that fading, <laughs> that QSB that you're talking about uh, hit uh, hit your signal and uh, you, your signal took a little bit of a dive during the middle of, uh, of your over. So, um, uh, but um, uh, you, I know, I know you were talking about uh, the how the, uh, uh, the 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 signal probably coming from me tonight was being affected. What you think by the aurora, auroral um, interference? Uh, I, I know that I know the uh, uh, aurora activity can create uh, a very interesting sound. Uh, on 80 meter propagation um, on a on an 80 meter transmission, I, I have heard it's very, very wavery sort of sound. Um, I don't hear it tonight. Um, I don't. I don't think there is any uh, auroral interference uh, happening, but uh, that's that's this location, of course. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm not sure um, uh, exactly what could be the reason for uh, the the what, the way you're hearing your signal up there tonight. Um, uh, yeah, now there was something else you mentioned. Um, it's just left me. I didn't take a note down. Uh, but, uh, oh yeah, last next week, yes. Um, no, I'm actually going to a, a, a music con uh, con a concert type thing, uh, which is uh, happening quite local to us. There's a... Uh, there's a, a, a building out at Fountain Gate Shopping Centre. It's uh, I've never been there. This is the first time I've been to this um, this uh, stadium. Uh, Bun Bunjil, I think they call it. Uh, I guess that's Aboriginal. Uh, Bunjil, I think they call it. And um, yeah, they've got a, a, a musical thing happening. And I thought it'd be really interesting to sit in on that one uh, since it happens to be dealing with Neil Diamond, uh, which is uh, somebody I've followed since I've been 12 years old. And uh, they're doing a musical tribute to um, to Neil Diamond's music in the form of uh, orchestra uh, arrangements. So uh, I'm keen to see how that comes across. So I thought I'd take. Well, it happened to be on. They're only available on, on a Friday night. So uh, uh, there it was. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you guys know the following week how that goes. Um, anyway, thanks, Ian. And um, thanks for the report, and thank you for listening in. Graham, VK3BDA, VK3EKH, have a say. Pretty impressive astrophotography shots 
Yeah, thanks, Graham. VK3 BDA, Bendigo, VK3 EKH replying. Excellent stuff. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, we, even with the radio astronomy section, uh, we're still using the Zoom uh, arrangement. So um, uh, apparently, uh, the ASV have acquired a room uh, at the Melbourne Observatory. So um, uh, I don't know how it's going to work out at this stage, but uh, uh, for the time being, um, the the old uh, club room uh, that was at um, Para Street uh, is uh, being disbanded and uh, no longer being used as a uh, meeting place. I think, as you know that. So uh, yeah, there's uh, the the uh, um, there's a new room or a room at the at Melbourne Observatory. Uh, which is going to be used. So I haven't heard any information, any more information about that. I don't know how it's all, all going to come about, but um, <clears throat> at least it gives us a chance to, to get back to those eye-to-eye you know, eye type meetings and it'll be interesting to see how it works out. Although, unfortunately, it means travelling into Melbourne uh, a little bit further. So uh, I know a few people aren't really pleased about having to... Uh, to go into Melbourne for the section meeting. So to some degree, I think the Zoom format will still probably uh, continue to uh, to be done. But that's another story. Thanks, Graham. Good signal from you. 20 over 9 and uh, good copy. Um, not a problem at all. Steve, VK3SPX. I don't know how I got FTX. I really don't. Anyway, <laughs> have a say, Steve. VK3SPX, VK3EKH. Yeah, no worries, Stephen. VK3 SPX, VK3 EKH replying. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I did receive an email from uh, from one of our um, uh, radio astronomy section meeting uh, members who lives in Alaska. In fact, uh, Whitlam Reeve uh, is an engineer and uh, he's uh, had a little bit of involvement with the, the HARP program. 
um, and the, the installation there to some degree. But he, he sent uh, an email out to, to us all with a, a schedule of programming um, of when these broadcasts were going to occur. Um, unfortunately, they do occur at some odd times, and uh, you have to be fairly vigilant to be um, operating your or near a radio receiver with the chance of being able to hear these transmissions. Um, I think you need to, uh, uh, to yeah, to just be available for it. So, I, unfortunately for me, I haven't, um, I really haven't shown that much of an interest in trying to to see whether anything can be detected uh, uh, this side of town. <laughs> um, Although the moon bounce would be interesting, uh, if if I had a, a a fairly good idea of when this transmission was going to occur, um, it might have been interesting to have seen if we could detect anything off the moon. That's of course providing that the moon is in the sky at the same time as it is over Alaska, and that's most likely not the case. So these uh, this this harp antenna system beams directly up into the uh, into the uh, into the sky uh, it's not beamed at the horizon um, so they would have to wait until the moon is pretty much overhead to take advantage of uh, reflecting a signal off the moon so um, and their purpose their, their receiving station is down in Mexico so it, it makes sense so it really doesn't come to our to to us guys here in, in Australia the uh, if the moon's not visible, we're not going to hear any reflection off the moon. And probably the same goes for Jupiter, for that matter. Um, but it would have been interesting. Um, I, I know that there has been uh, experiments where people have, um, amateurs or, or, or uh, people with receiving systems, have tuned in or, or f uh, pointed their UHF antennas at, um, at the moon and they're able to receive uh, distant uh, UHF TV transmissions. Um, you know, the telltale sign of, uh, of overseas UHF transmitters, which uh, uh, are being, of course, reflected off the moon. Not intentionally, of course, but there is some a certain degree of, uh, of, uh, of radiation that does uh, go off into space. So... Um, uh, it, it has been seen to, to, uh, to do that. So it is interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of problems uh, with uh, radio for radio astronomy uh, or radio astronomers with uh, uh, trying to to study the universe and at the same time trying to filter out what's man-made. Um, and with this copious amounts of satellites in orbit, it's becoming harder and harder and harder. So, uh, building a radio astronomy installation on the other side of the moon is looking more favorable every day <laughs> anyway we haven't heard jack vk3 tjs and shepherd and it's been a couple of weeks now and i'm a bit worried that um jack might have been flooded out so uh, i don't know if anybody's heard uh, jack vk3 tjs but uh uh we haven't heard jack uh, over the last uh, few fridays so i'm just hoping he's not uh not one of the folks up there at shepherd that have uh, been experienced with uh, flooding problems i guess we'll find out in due course is there any other stations wishing to check in? VK3 EKH listening. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to my carrying ons tonight. It's, um, again, I tried to make it a short one, but it's just impossible. So, <laughs> anyway, I'll, uh, I'll aim to, uh, to get to bed before midnight, and uh, I'll have to be up at around probably quarter to five to get ready to for departure at six it's an eight eight and a half eight and a half hour drive to where i've got to go tomorrow um and then i'm coming straight back so uh, i anticipate being back by midnight um so it's going to be a long day in the car and uh, i hope i really do hope i don't have any mechanical issues with this super we shall find out anyway i'll let you all know in the in two weeks time how that went Anyway, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, concluding the transmissions for tonight. Thank you very much for listening and watching on YouTube. And for everybody up there on the uh, the chat window, Nebs and uh, Richard, um, being about the only ones up there on the Discord, we'll see you in two weeks' time. Take care, stay dry, and, um, and may your horse win if you've got anything to do with Melbourne Cup. 
Cheers, everyone. This is VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone concluding tonight. Cheers, everyone. Yes, Graham. Well, that's nice. What's that got to do with the price of fish? Oh, <laughs> oh, may the horse be with you. Oh, I see. Oh, my God. All right. Thanks, Gray. I'm not doing any... Look, I actually put in a, a ticket in I was lot of, um, in Powerball and I actually won... Uh, I haven't added it up. It's about oh, over 100 bucks. Uh, I, I got my ticket money almost back. So uh, that that was with Oz Lotto um, Powerball last night. I was hoping for a uh, a million, but uh, there it was. Well, bless their heart. <laughs> Well, yes, it's actually not Adelaide. It's um, a little, <laughs> it's a little country town just outside the metropolitan area of Adelaide. So, um, it's it's the main highway on on all the way, uh, and then at some point I turn off towards a place called Cuddly Creek. No, no. Like I said, nowhere near the no, nowhere near the city. Uh, and if you're still listening, Dennis, or if you are listening, Dennis, uh, following up on a conversation on the repeater earlier tonight, um, no, I, I have no desire to sightsee. I mean, the fact that I'm driving between here and almost Adelaide uh, is enough sightseeing. <laughs> I'll be quite happy to get back home. Um, it's been ages since I've been in South Australia. Uh, I think the last time I was in South Australia uh, was when we went to um, to the um, ham fest at, uh, at um, Mount Gambia. Well, I forget what they call it now. Anyway, yeah, I think when we went across in, in your car that day, time. And um, yeah, so that would have been the last time I went into South Australia. Uh, the last time up to Adelaide and through Adelaide would have been back in the Christmas of 1989-1990. Uh, so, uh, no, I'm not going anywhere near the city. Um, I'm just going to go to this little country town uh, uh, place. Uh, C-U-D-L-E-E, -E, I think is how it's spelt. Cudley. C-U-D-L-E-E, -E, Cudley Creek. So, um, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's just off the main highway, probably by about 50 k's or so, something like that. Um, yeah. So, um it's a it's an eight and a half hour drive, plus or minus a couple of stops that I'll probably make on the way. Over.
No. I gather you're not watching YouTube, but doesn't, that doesn't really matter. Um, I've got Cuddly Creek up on Google Earth um, from what uh, one can see of it, it, just for the sake of it, showing up on uh, on YouTube. There's no been no Melbourne TV repeater tonight. It's been, uh, the, the RTV repeater has been off air again, so uh, we've uh, been mostly on, on YouTube. Um, I intend coming straight back. Gray, I, I'm not staying anywhere. Um, uh, I, if I can get away at six o'clock, I envisage I'll, I'll be there um, at this person's place at about anywhere between two thirty and three o'clock, um, around about that time. Uh, this transmitter is uh, over four hundred kilograms, so it's uh, it, it'll slide into the back of the Subaru. Okay. Um, but I, I don't intend mucking around. I just want to do a U bolt and head straight back home, exactly the same way I came. I'm not not deviating from the main highway at all. So um, uh, I envisage I'll be back just before midnight, um, probably about eleven o'clock or so, if uh, all goes to plan. Um, and uh, I'll, having said that, uh, as I said to Tony tonight, BK three VAT Tony. Um, if I can make the trip out and back and the car performs absolutely well, no, no issues at all with the, um, uh, with the, uh, the car, uh, you know, it performs okay, <coughs> I'll uh, invest in getting a, a bull bar uh, fitted to the front of the car so that I can put HF back in the car. There's no, no provision for HF in the car, so... Um, uh, as soon as I can get the bull bar fitted, I can put the nine foot steel whip on, and uh, then reinstall the seven oh six, which will be really good. It'd be nice to have HF back in the car. So yep, it'll be just uh, VHF UHF comms um, on the way, and I don't know what the repeater, uh, or what kind of repeaters there are up there, but uh, um, that doesn't particularly worry me. All right, um, so there it is. Um, I just uh, tomorrow is going to be probably the best day out of this whole period where rain will be at a minimum. So as soon as I get out of uh, of Melbourne, um, I should uh, I should be getting into better weather, and uh, all the way across to uh, to South Australia, and uh, and hopefully conversely the back heading back should be also okay. Anyway, we'll see. But I'll, I'll once I get in range of the repeater here, I'll uh, I'll pick up and uh, give a call to see if, if anybody's around at this time of the night. It's it'll be about now that I'll be sh- should be coming back. Um, I, I would say, VK three GL, VK three CSJ.
Yeah, not a problem. VK3GL in Bunyip, VK3CSJ in Warren South. Yep, um, you're hovering around 20 over 9, uh, so uh, easy copy. But the, the the lightning crashes are fairly intense. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of static there, so um, it's a noisy night on 80 metres. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I figure that... <clears throat> Uh, if you know, if I can get away uh, from uh, this guy's place straight away, you know, if I, I'm not delayed to any great degree, um, you know, by the time I, I cross the the border back into Victoria, it should still be daylight, and um, uh, you know, once I, I can see, uh, you know, the next town in Victoria, um, you know, it's just a matter of counting down the. Count, count, ticking off the towns that I go through and once I see Ballarat um, I know that I'm pretty much home and hose <clears throat> so uh, again I just hope that the Subaru manages it okay um, you know I, I, I acknowledge that the extra weight in the car but you know the, the, the car is designed to to hold five people um, so if you can imagine five five people averaging 90 kilograms each let's say Maybe even a hundred kilograms each. <laughs> you know, five big blokes uh, in there. The Subaru should be happy with that. So it's just me and uh, and uh, this uh, big thing. Anyway, look, I I prefer you know to get it into the car because I was thinking about a trailer, but I I just didn't want this transmitter to be bouncing around in a trailer and exposed to any rain. Um, so at least it'll be relatively protected uh, in the in the back of the car, and uh, I'll get a couple of blokes on uh, on Sunday afternoon to come around and help us get it out, <laughs> get it into the into the barn here. So uh, it should be okay. I, I'm I'm taking plenty of uh, of um, little uh, nibbly food things to uh, to keep me awake. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll we'll see how we go. I mean, it's not as you know, it's not uncommon for me to to go up to Heathcote to the Dark Sky site up at Heathcote for a, a for one of our get-togethers, you know, the barbecue, and come home in the morning. You know, I'll be leaving there at midnight, uh, and uh, and come home, you know, be home by two, three o'clock in the morning, or even later. Uh, so I, I certainly know what it's like to drive at night time, um, but. Um, this this should be okay. I, I can't see too many of issues. I mean, I'll be coming through Melbourne, you know, in the uh, early evening. You know, or not quite, but in that sort of time frame anyway. Anyway, we'll see how we go. Um, and if I can get the Ballarat repeater, then I'll, I'll give you a call. Um, yeah, we'll see how we go. Anyway, I must finish here, turn everything off. And um, it sounds like it's still raining outside. It really is annoying me. I, I wish this rain would disappear because... Um, Every time it rains, it's uh, you know the, the the water that we have the problem at the back of the barn is uh, accumulates, and I've already had to mop up a little bit of the rain, uh, a, a flooding at the back of the barn. So uh, you know, I just wish it would give us a break. Um, I haven't got the radar up at the moment. Oh, there, there it is. Yeah, um, I'll just to zoom in to Melbourne here. And um, uh, no, there's no rain. I can't see Melbourne radars. No, it's not showing any rain. It must be just fan noise. I can hear it just sounds like rain falling. But there's no rain at the moment. There's a bit of rain over you. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of, there should be a little bit of precipitation over Bunyip at the moment. But uh, nothing here at the moment. It looks actually not too bad for the next few hours. So that's that's good to see. All right, I'm falling asleep at the microphone. Catch you later, Gray. If we catch you on the, if I can catch you on the wireless tomorrow, that'll be good. VK3 GL, VK3 CSJ.
Yeah, see, so Gray, your signal faded down a little bit into the noise, so um, it's good old propagation on 80 metres. Cheers, mate, for now. VK3 CS Joe Clean. And to everybody still watching on YouTube, thank you for hanging in there. Uh, and uh, like I said, we'll be back in two weeks' time on the 11th of November to continue the process of reporting the latest on astronomical things. Um, and uh, if I am here on Sunday morning, I'll be doing the AS, uh, the, um, the WIA broadcast on YouTube. Since uh, Melbourne TV repeat is not working, I'll just run it through the YouTube on Sunday morning. Courtesy of Bevan, VK5 BD. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you're doing nothing tomorrow night, um, don't forget to listen in to uh, Chris Long's broadcast on uh, YouTube tomorrow night between 9, 9.30 and midnight uh, on uh, 147.475 and uh, on his YouTube channel, VK3AML. A little bit of a plug there for Chris. So cheers, everyone. Take care as we fade into a set of colour bars.